Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. We're talking about the, the new birth, to be born of God, what, it, what happened to us when we got sa- you know, saved, when we, came, we gave our life to God, you know, all kinds of terms people use. Jesus referred to it as the new birth. You know, um, the right, Paul wrote and said that we're to walk in newness of life, that we're born of God. How many are born of God? Anybody here born again? Jesus is your master. Jesus is your savior. Glory to God. Then you're born of God. Now, let me say this. E.W. Kenyon said a number of years ago. Now, Brother Kenyon went home to be with the Lord about 19, I think 58 or somewhere in there. I'm not pr- pretty sure. Something, you know, in the 50s area. He, he went home to be with the Lord. And that, but in his writings, his writings are still as relevant today as ever. You know, people are always trying to be relevant. You know, we got magazines that refer to how to be relevant. Let me say something. Get anointed. Yeah. That's relevant. Walk in the power of the Spirit. That's relevant. Now, I'm, and listen, I'm, I'm not just, just knocking things. Oh, you know, you can't, don't, don't do anything to make yourself different. You know, don't, you know, just keep your high liturgical services, and, you know, and when they just got to put up with that. I'm saying that we look at the most relevant thing you will ever have in your life is the anointing of God, the power of God, walking according to how God tells us to walk. That is the most relevant thing you can do to reach out to people. Be anointed. Amen. I said be anointed. Hallelujah. Because the Word of God says it's the anointing that destroys the yoke. Your program doesn't destroy yokes. The anointing does. So we want to walk in the anointing. Can you say amen? So we're talking about, we're talking about being born again. What, you know, we talked about how, what it meant that you were actually born again. Your spirit became alive unto God. You know, and that's wonderful. And many churches tell people how to get born again. But one thing that I've, I think we've missed over the years, and we, tried, we did it during the teaching revival, and now we've kind of reverted back because of the extreme grace teaching. People being told no matter what you do, you're going to heaven. God loves you. God's not going to get rid of you. You can be out committing adultery and fornication, and you can rob banks and do all this kind of stuff. You can be a homosexual. You can do this. It doesn't matter because you're under grace and God's already forgiven you. And the truth of the matter is how we walk should be a representation of what's taking place in us. Robbing banks is not what we're supposed to be doing. Are you here? Cussing people out in the drive-thru or the, the drive-thru person because they didn't do your food right. It's not what Christians do. You know, sitting around drunk all the time ain't what Christians do. Somebody say Amen. What do we do? We live out of this new man on the inside who's been made alive unto God because you're born of his spirit, and that man is to govern how we live. Well, how do we get there? You got people telling you it doesn't matter how you live. So what what are you what are they telling people? They're telling people when they say it doesn't matter how you live, that you can go ahead and live out of your flesh and it's okay. Yet the Bible says in Romans 12th chapter and the first verse that we're to offer our bodies a living sacrifice to God, which is our spiritual service. It's a spiritual service. Why? Because we, we do not descend to the lowest part of man to find out where to live from. We ascend up into the heavens. Amen. He ascended up on high and led captivity captive. And then Ephesians said that, you know, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Amen. We're seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And we are to, we're created uh, uh, unto good works. Amen. We are his workmanship. Well, well he's not talking about your flesh. He's talking about that new man on the inside is the workmanship of God. And we are created unto good works. We're told to put away the unprofitable works of darkness. There's a lot of things we're told to do, but how do we do it? How do we learn? How do we get to the place where we're no longer living out of the flesh, but we're living out of the spirit? Well, um, we read Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 17 last week. We're talking about we're children of God. We're heirs of God. We're joint heirs of Jesus Christ. We're talking about you need to be spiritually minded. You need to be mindful of spiritual things. You don't need to be mindful of your flesh. How many of you have been mindful of your flesh? I mean, we do that occasionally. We do it usually around breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You get real mindful of your flesh because it starts talking. Anybody ever had your flesh talk to you around supper time? Are you right? In Jamestown, we have the uh, Flowers Bakery. 
And if you go there at certain times of the day, all that yeast and all the, 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 the aroma from cooking all that bread just comes out. And I tell you, you can ride by there and all of a sudden your flesh is talking. Yeah. Hungry bread and butter. Hallelujah. I mean, you're ready to go get you some. I mean, your brother Copeland used to go, get, go to a place like that, get a loaf of bread right out and take a whole stick of butter and put on it. And eat it. And he was over. If you, you ever seen some old pictures of Brother Cup? Brother Cup was overweight at one time. Well, you can't eat whole loaves of bread fresh out of the bakery with a stick of butter on it and not gain weight. You can cast all them carrots out you want to, but you're just being foolish. Eh? You're going to gain some weight, baby. You may enjoy doing it, but you're going <laughs> to. I mean, you might be going, ooh, I know I'm going to gain weight. Ooh, this is good. I can, it's like Krispy Kremes, hot donuts now. Everybody rode by, you won't even think about Krispy Kreme, ride by and see that sign, hot donuts now. <laughs> I mean, you might run through the front door getting in there. And with your car, not your body. I mean, now you're going, and you see them coming, they're, they're just that, that layer of sugar just dripping on them as they come by. You're like, Ooh, cool. I mean, you, you get filled with the Holy Ghost all over again. Glory to God. Make you shout, won't it? What's that? Your flesh is talking. Everybody know your flesh is talking. How many of you ever thought, you know, the Lord's leading me to fast, and the next day five people call you, invite you to the all-you-can-eat buffet somewhere? What's that? Or are you, gonna pan brown or you Yeah. Or somebody comes in to work with the whole box of Krispy Kremes. And you th they, th hey, they just came off the, they came off the assembly line as I was in there. Praise God. <laughs> Lord, I think you were talking about tomorrow. <laughs> Your flesh is talking. Are you here? You start saying things like, well, you know, the Lord showed me. And it's always something contrary to his word, but the Lord showed you it was okay to do whatever. That's your flesh. We can't live there. we got to be spiritually minded. Paul wrote to the church of Colossae and said this. He says, set your affections on things above and not, come on, on the earth. We're to have our affections on godly things, on the things of heaven. Come on now, church. Praise God. Your mind functions by the information you give it. It governs our thoughts. It governs our desires. It governs our intents. And what you're letting come into your mind is what you're going to be thinking on. And as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The meditation that you have will begin to guide and run your life. Now, I've said this a number of times in the past, and I'll say it again. When you're in the arena of faith, you always win. You get into the arena of reason, and Satan is going to clean your clock. Where is the reason of reason? It's in the mind. When Satan begins to say, well, how about this one? You got people going around, a loving God will never send anybody to hell. And their implication is one thing. The truth is, no, a loving God will never send anybody to hell. A loving God, the loving God, took his own son when man was bound for hell because of his associate with Satan. John 8, 44, you are of your father the devil and the lust of your father you will fulfill. And mankind was in that state. God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh to redeem us from that place that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. The act of love that God granted was he gave his own son to pay the price for our sin and that if anyone will believe on him, they won't perish. That was what love. It's not that you're living in sin. You're not going to accept Jesus. You're going to reject Jesus and it don't matter. And God, the loving God won't send you to hell. No. The loving God's already gave you. It's his way or the highway. I'm just going to tell you folks. Yeah. With God, it is his way or the highway. It is receive Jesus or go to hell. It's turn or burn, shake or bait, try or fry. All right. All right. Those are your choices. Because God's already made the provision. And then once you're born again, he demands something of you. That is to grow up spiritually and walk out of the spirit and not according to the flesh. Your mind is to be renewed. It's to think the things of God. It's to meditate on the things of God. Why? Because we said last week, the carnal mind is enmity against God. Cannot be subject to the law. Is, is, not, I think it says, is not subject to the laws of God. Neither indeed can be. That's why you've got to renew your mind so that it has a spiritual mindset, spiritually on the things of God the Father, not some ooh, spirituality. I, I'm willing to be myself out into nothing here. I don't want to be into nothing. I want to be full of him. I'm not trying to empty myself into nothing. I'm trying to be full of him, his character, his nature. Hallelujah. 
I'm not coming back as a cow next time. Hello? You know, somebody's talking about Hindus the other day. You know, Hindus have, uh, Hinduism has over two million gods. Two million. Jesus could be one of them. You know, and your, and your, and your, your self keeps going out there, and, and if you're really bad, you come back to the lower. You've got to work your way back up the chain. And ultimately, at some point in time, you'll finally get to the right place that you, you can become a, a Dalai Lama. Not the demon llama from the Emperor's New Groove. Demon llama, demon llama, demon llama. So if you've got kids, you've seen that probably, the Emperor's New Groove. You've got the demon llama in it. Now, you can come back as, a, as, as an, an enlightened. You can come back in that, that, you know, you just never know what's going to happen. You just got to keep working through these stages. Thank God Jesus came and made it easy. He came and paid the price. He said, believe on me, you get, and you get the new life. Praise God. Once you've received that new life, you have to learn how to allow it that new life, because you've been trained all your life to live out of your flesh. Everything, how many of them marketing is all designed for flesh? No, there's nothing spiritual about marketing. It's all fleshly driven. And about 95% of it is driven by sex. Take this pill and you're going to look like this babe. And the truth of the matter is, she's probably photoshopped. You know, you take this pill, you're going to look like that. You know, you're going to lose 80 pounds in three months and not have any side effects from it. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, men, take this pill and your wife will be chasing you all through the house because you're such a man. Oh, come on now. We're, we're, we use the flesh to market the people. Even food we use. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The stuff you see on the billboard and on television ain't what you get in the restaurant most of the time. Boy, it looks good on there. I mean, you know, you go in there. How many of you have ever gotten cheesecake somewhere? I remember those little placards they put on the table. I'd be this, I'd be this a honker piece. It's a New York style cheesecake, real tall. And let me, and got cherries on it and cherry juice just running all down on them. You say, oh, glory to God. Yours comes out and looks like, I mean, it was for Minnie Mouse. It's a third the size, got two cherries on it, a little dribble on it. And that, you know, they're, what are they doing? They're using fleshly means to advertise. They're, they're, they're appealing to your fleshly side to get you to buy, purchase the product. But see, as Christians, we're to become spiritually minded. We're to think on godly things so that our spirit gains ascendancy and we live out of the light that's in that spirit man who's alive unto God. It's not going to happen automatically. You get, filled, you get born again, you get filled with the Holy Ghost, and you do not automatically do everything you're supposed to do. If that were true, the Bible, New Testament would be this. Receive Jesus Christ, be filled with spirit, see you in heaven. Because he's going to make everything. And it doesn't work that way. Over, it's over and over again, we're told to do things like put off the old man and put on the new. Amen. We're told to not have anything to do with the unfruitful works of darkness. We're to walk in the light as he's in the light. Over and over again, we keep, we keep being told there's another place for you to live than where you came from. Now, remember back in January, we preached a sermon or a couple of weeks or so called Egypt Just Ain't All That. See, the children of Egypt, after 400 years of bondage, and whining and complaining and fussing and griping for 400 years, God delivers them. They went out in the desert, we're in the one hard place. Would to God we were in the land of Egypt. At least we'd have something to eat. For 400 years, you've been griping and complaining about being there, and two, two weeks out on the road, I wish we could go back. What was that talking? Flesh. I said that was flesh talking. See, they had, all they had ever done was bondage and captivity, but they knew it. It was familiar to them. They knew if they went out there and stomped all day, there'd be some food when they got home. May not like it, but it was something to eat. Come on now. And they knew that. And that was more comforting to them to know that they could be whipped and beat and doing all that. But at least they knew there would be some food there. Then to be brought out here and had to trust God. Why? Because they were carnal. They didn't know how to live by faith. They didn't know how to live out of the spirit man. And so they went, they reverted back to what they knew the most. And you've been trained your whole life in this world to be led and to be governed and to be controlled by your flesh. And when you get born again, somebody's got to teach you, you got to, you got to start to live another way. Because the new man on the inside is where you're to live from. The new man on the inside is where the life of God is. The new man on the inside is who you are. Amen? And you're created by him. Glory be to God. Can you somebody shout glory? glory? 
That was a little bit better preaching than I got amens. I got some head shakes. Amen. Hallelujah. Look at Proverbs, yeah, Proverbs 23, 7. Glory be to God. I said it's good to be born again. It's good to have Jesus on the inside. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open that door, I and my Father will come in and sup with him, make our abode with him. Hallelujah. He's with us, glory to God. He's not only with us, he's in us. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen. Proverbs 23, 7 says, As he eat and drink, uh, as he eat and drink, saith he, but his heart is not with thee. Glory to God. Where, 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 where is it? Come on now. It's, it's in there somewhere. A man saw him. I'm in Proverbs 23, 7. Yeah, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Verse 7, I, I went so past the first part so quick. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. What are you thinking about? What do you think about you? How do you see you as a, as a believer now? This isn't, now listen, I am telling you this is not self-help. This is not mind over matter. This is not the power of positive thinking. This is who are you and how do you see yourself? Because if you do not see yourself the way God sees you, you've got to change where you get your information. See, your information needs to be coming out of God and his word so that he paints the picture of who you are. Hallelujah. So you can see who he says you are, not how you think you are. Because remember, all your life you've been trained to see yourself as the flesh. How your flesh dictates to you, what the fleshly desires are. But the Bible says, you know, that if you think in your heart, so are you. We have to now begin to see ourselves the way God sees us. You get Greek scholars who go through the whole New Testament and call the Christian the believing sinner. Yet Paul wrote to the church and said we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That we're his workmanship created in the good works. He even calls us saints. It says we're a, we're, that we're a royal priesthood. Glory to God. Amen. Now the, 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 remember the scripture says he's made us kings and priests under our God. Literally in the Greek it says he's made us a kingdom of priests. Not kings and priests. We're a kingdom of priest. Using the Old Testament analogy of the priesthood, the tribe of Levi that had all the spiritual service in the temple. And that tribe, and that tribe, the high priest was allowed to go in to the Holy of Holies. But thanks be to God, we're a kingdom of priests. And there's no longer a veil. But it's been rent in twain from top to bottom. And we now have access to the very mercy seat of God. To stand in his presence. Paul wrote to the church of Corinth and says, therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, even in your time of need. How can you do that? Because you're a priest. You're in the kingdom of priests. We have a high priest. His name is Jesus. And he's already gone in and made a way, put his own blood on the altar. All men can come before the presence of God because the final high priest the one who was slain from the foundation of the world, entered in with his blood, glory to God, and went up to the mercy. Why did he go to the mercy seat? Because that's how far man's sin went. Remember, the earthly tabernacle was made after the pattern. You can find this in your Bible. The pattern of Moses of the things he saw in heaven. So the mercy seat where the blood was put was a pattern of what he saw in heaven. What man's authority went up to but did not include the throne of God when man cre God created him. Therefore, his sin went that far. And so that, that had to be cleansed in heaven by the blood of Jesus. But Jesus has entered in. How many times? Once and for all with his own blood to obtain an eternal redemption for us. That don't make you want to dance. Hallelujah. Singing all that about that bass won't make you dance either. Hallelujah. Saw this video the other day on Facebook. It was, it was not all about that bass. It was all about that bass. More butter. It's all about that bass. About that bass. More butter. I like the, yes, sir, that's it. Probably. More butter on the turkey. More butter on the mashed potatoes. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? But you, start, you, you, can't, you can't contain yourself when you begin to think on how, how much God has done for you. You see, when you got born again, it wasn't, you know, see, we, we, we take terms in the Bible and we, we use it in a way that people don't get, you know. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But that doesn't, you know, you know it's not just that you're not going to go to hell. You're not rescued from going to hell and, you know, we got you back on the boat, buddy, just, just sit there and, and, and chill out because you're not going to hell. Something supernatural took place when you got born again. The very life of God overtook you. Your spirit was born from death unto life. 
And once again, God's spirit. Remember in Genesis, it said he took, the Bible says he formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Amen. Became a living soul. I think, I think the, the original language says a speaking spirit. Where did that come from? Well, see, if you study the Hebrew and the Greek words for breath, actually, here it is, both Hebrew and Greek. The, word, the, the, the Hebrew word and the Greek word for breath is the same word for wind and the same word for spirit. God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into him the spirit of life. God took of his own very own spirit and put into that body, and it became a speaking spirit. It came alive. When Adam committed high treason in the garden, that went out. He was born of Satan's nature. He was separated from God spiritually. And he became a carnal being. He lived out of his flesh. Because his spirit could no longer be in contact with God. Satan drove his flesh. Those spirits of the, of the, uh, of the pre-Adamic race loved to have flesh so they could commit uh, atrocities against the things of God. Remember the, remember the, uh, the guy, madman of the Gadarenes had the, the legion of demons in him? And they just, they, they, if you come to cast us into the pit before the time, you know, let us go into the pigs. They wanted to be in some kind of flesh. And the pigs didn't want to. They went down and drowned themselves. <laughs> People ought to be as smart as the pigs. I mean, that whole, that whole herd, of, a whole, whatever you call them, herd, whatever you call pigs, you know, they ran out the cliff and just drowned themselves. They didn't want them in them either. But Satan drives the flesh. That's why we have all this perverse sin now and all this crazy sin going on. We now got writings now that they've, they've, the, the courts are trying to make homosexuality normal. They're even getting writings now. You're picking up papers where people want to marry their animals. And people are envisioning the day they can marry their dog. This is, this is perverse. Why? But it's, it's that spirit of darkness, that kingdom of darkness, driving man into all, all kinds of perversion with the flesh because he makes, 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 makes man be governed by his flesh. Whatever his flesh wants to do, he does. But God calls us to another place. His life came in us, and he called us to move up higher and to live out of another realm, glory to God, where our spirit governs and our spirit reigns. And it keeps, Paul says, I keep my body under. He told you to offer the living sacrifice. Our bodies are now to become subordinate to the desires of our spirit. How do we get there? We're renewing the mind and finding out how, how, what's in us. Amen. Two of you said, you shook your heads, yes. That's good preaching, Pastor. And I know it. Go ahead. I am. Go, Pastor. Go. Come on. All right. Where do you get your information? Look at Genesis chapter 3. Go ahead, look at Genesis chapter 3. That's way back at the front of your Bible. Verse 8. Verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And he said unto the woman, Yea, Hath God said, underline that. Every challenge going on in society right now is Satan challenging the authority of God Amen. and what God said. Every challenge is challenging the authority of God. Satan comes to the woman and the first thing he does, he challenges the authority and the integrity of God. Hath God said. Hello, <clears throat> ye shall not eat. I'll have to get back my Bible here. Um, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the servant, we may, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat of it. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, he didn't say you should not touch it. You go back and read, he said, you don't eat of it. For God doth, do, this, this is, and the serpent said to the woman, ye shall not surely die. Every sin starts with whatever God's word says is going to happen to you because you do it, it ain't going to happen. Everyone. He challenges God's authority. He challenges what God said. Y'all hear you going home. Satan will challenge it <clears throat> and offer you an alternate reality. His, his reality. 
For God doth now, now, listen, first of all, he challenges God's authority, then challenges his, his, his integrity to tell the truth, then he challenges his, just his very character. For God doth know that in the days you eat there, your eyes will be open, and you should be as gods, knowing good and evil. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. The knowledge of good and evil is not good. God never intended us to know the knowledge of evil. You read Paul's writing, he said that the things people do in darkness are shameful, shouldn't even be uttered by us. Are y'all here? He said, not only did God lie to you because you won't die when you eat of it, God had an ulterior motive. He didn't want you to be like him. Because when you eat it, you'll know both good and evil. He challenged God's very character. No, God knew. See, if we had lived in the garden, if Adam and Eve hadn't committed high treason and we just stayed on that plane, he had subdued the devil at that moment, put him under his feet. Remember, take, uh, be fruitful, multiply, replenish earth, and do what? Subdue it. From what? The devil. Subdue. He could have subdued him. He was not on the, I know some of y'all had this, I had these Sunday school pictures. Adam is on the backside fishing, and Eve shows up with the fruit and gives it to him. He goes, oh, woman, what have you done? We find out the Bible says he was standing right there with her. And instead of doing what he was supposed to do, subdue the earth, he let it take place. And when he saw his woman's light go out, he took it and went with her. And some people say, where would we be without Eve? In the garden. No, you wouldn't. God's, God never intended for man to be alone. Are you here? He intended for him to have a help mate. Glory to God. Listen to this. For God doth know in the days you eat there, your eyes will be open, you shall know, be as God's knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that it was good for food, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, and the fruit thereof she did give, she did eat, and give also to her husband with her, and he did eat. Notice, she saw it was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and desired to make one wise. The, pride, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Amen. Are you here? Saw that it was Saul. Lust of the eyes. Good, uh, pleasant, I'm sorry, lust of the flesh, so it was good for food. Pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes, and make one wise the pride of life. Now, those are the three same temptations that Satan brought to Jesus in the wilderness. And each time he said, it is written. It is written. It is written. And he overcame. And the Bible says that when he went into the wilderness, he went in full of the Holy Ghost. And he returned unto Jerusalem. He came out in the power of the Spirit. And that's what God wants you to learn to do is that as you are growing in Christ and you're growing in the nurture and nature of Christ and you're beginning to learn how to put all these things on, you may have gone out, you may have come out of this new, this new experience, born of the Spirit and full of the Spirit, but after taking the devil on head to head, toe to toe, no eyeball to eyeball, I mean you come out and not only are you coming out, victorious, you're coming out full. Not only full of the Spirit, but in the power of the Spirit. You've overcome. Now you live out of that power. You've learned to say, no, I'm not going to live out of my flesh. I'm going to live out of my spirit because it's alive under God. And man, the time. How many give me eight minutes? All right. Larry gave me twice. I, I got about 40 minutes here. Thank you. All right. And the eyes of them were both were open, and they saw that they were naked. Why were they naked? Now, see, people, people think that, you know, how many have heard these nudist colonists going in there? We're just like Adam and Eve in the garden. No, you ain't. You old nasty thing, you. I mean, my God, put something on. I don't even want to see your old wrinkled up, shriveled up arms, much less anything else. Come on. When they were in the garden, they were clothed in the glory of God. They were light beings. You know, Yoda had it right. <coughs> Cruel things like this, and you're not... Luminous beings we are. Bzz, all right, anyway. We're full of the life of God. The light of God is in us. Go back and read about Lucifer before we fell. The bright morning star, the, the day star. He walked on the earth and he was covered in topazes and diamonds and emeralds. And, and he was a light being before he fell. And because of, the, because of the reason of his glory, he got lifted up in pride. All that light was shining. He was, a, he, was a, he was the anointed cherub that covered the throne of God, and all that glory was coming out of him. But he led a rebellion against heaven, and it all went out, and he lost it. He didn't want anybody else to have it either. 
Adam and Eve were clothed in the glory of God. So they weren't naked because they were covered in the glory. Well, what are we talking about? Remember Jesus came down to the Mount Transfiguration? And his, faith, and his, his, his countenance and his clothing, his, 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 the glory that came out of him changed his raiment so it glistened like the noonday sun. Moses came out of the mount with God and they had to put a veil over his face because he was just reflecting the glory that he had been in the presence of. Now think about a man who had never sinned with God's spirit put in him and God is light. Remember, God is light. And that just coming out of his flesh, he's covered in it. Are you here? You're going home. And so Adam and Eve were covered in the glory. And the minute they ate the fruit and committed high treason against God, the glory went out. They were born of Satan. They knew they were naked then because all the glory was gone. There ain't been a nudist colony on the planet that's like that. Hello. The old nasties. Anyway. Yeah, you watch Meet the Browns or the Browns, whatever. Brown, that's just nasty. All right. That's, I have to agree with them. That's just nasty. Don't even want to think about it, do you? Especially in church. But where are you getting your information? You can't get your information from the devil. I see Christians, they get in, they get in a tight spot, and they go to ungodly friends and ask for counsel. Now, you know, some of you guys' friends that get the finger going and get the head to going. And going to tell you something. And I tell you what I do. I don't care what you do. What does the Bible say? Yeah. There's safety in the multitude of counselors. Godly counselors, not dodo counselors. The reason, you, the reason I don't want to do what you guys do, I see your life. Yeah. If I do what you do, I'm going to be messed up like you. But why would you go to somebody that messed up? Come on. Get their information. Yeah. Get it from them. I mean, dumb plus is dumb makes dumb. Squared. Y'all here? We need, we, need to, we need to get our information from the right place. Devil, the Satan and his kingdom is not where you get your information from. People come into church, well, I just, I just think, you know, that, that homosexual gays and lesbians need love too. They do need, they need the love of God, but it's not love to tell them that, to, to, to continue in a lifestyle that will take them to hell. No more than, to, than somebody who's a serial rapist. Oh, it's okay. God understands. God made you that way. You just keep raping people. It's all right. Sin, sin. And you keep staying connected to Satan, you're going to hell. That's wrong. It's wrong for the church to tell people it's okay to live in, in lifestyles that the Bible clearly states is unholy and ungodly. We can't, we can't keep doing that to people. We've got to tell them the truth. And they need to get their information from God's word and live the way God says it. God has a way for you to live. And let me tell you, honey, it ain't according to your flesh. It's according to a spirit. And living out of your spirit and living life according to God's laws and the way God says do things, it will bring peace. It will bring joy in the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. There's nothing you can do that will make you any happier than obeying God and walking with God. Amen. Living out of your spirit. Because your flesh will let you down. Because it's flaky. You can come into a service. Pastor is preaching. Well, I felt the anointing today. Glory be to God. Get halfway home on the interstate. Somebody cut you off. <laughs> right by by and flip them off four times. Now you feel better. Now, wasn't that a good sermon? After you flip them off. You pass on by the person after you flip them off. You got Jesus is Lord. Get saved today. God loves you all over the back of your car. I got to tell you, some, one of our church family people, they got upset with somebody there and they flipped them off and then the, the, guy, the person they flipped off calls them. Hey, brother so-and-so, appreciate you flipping me off. <laughs> There's another church member. <laughs> Beware, lest your sins find you out. No, God never intended for us to live out of the flesh. He intended for us to live out of that new man. Why? Because that new man lives in a whole nother plane altogether. We talked out of Romans 8 recently how that God, you know, that we're no longer under the dominion of sin. We're no longer under the authority of the kingdom of sin. We're no longer under the authority of Satan's kingdom. We've been raised up to walk in a whole new plane altogether, Wayne of says. We live in the newness of life, a whole new plane altogether. What plane is that? One where you live out of your spirit, not out of your flesh. Yeah, you got to take care of fleshly needs, but it doesn't govern you. 
Your flesh doesn't govern you. And the way you find out is you get the information from the right place. You ain't going to get the right stuff from the devil. See, when I hear Christians say things that are opposite of the Bible, I know where they've been getting their information. They, they've been listening to some, you know, somebody's got articulate speech and they can, they can persuade you with great arguments. And then, well, it makes sense to me. Yeah, it makes sense to what? The carnal mind. But it doesn't make sense to the spiritual mind. Why? Because the spiritual mind is submitted to the things of God. Remember, the wisdom of this world is earthly, sensual, and devilish. It's interesting that Paul put the word sensual in there. We talked about the, the, the uh, wisdom of this world. It's earthly, sensual. And then it says devilish. See, the carnal mind will just dream up all kinds of things and, and all kinds of things and say, well, God loves me and it doesn't matter what I do with my body. It's okay. It does matter. Eating, eating like a pig every time you sit down at the table. That matters. God, the Bible says a glutton should put a knife to his throat. Not eat more. Well, you're being gluttonous today. Here's another servant. Go ahead on for it, baby. God said put a knife to your throat. We should, Dad Hagen said this a number of years ago. He, he was eating, drinking Coca-Cola on a regular basis. He said he picked up one one day, and he said, I got to have this. And he said, nope, I'll never drink another Coca-Cola as long as I live. And put it down. He wouldn't let anything have him. He wouldn't let anything in this world govern how he conducted himself. Amen? Amen. I'll never have another diet right as long as I live. Hallelujah. It's a joke. Anyway. Anybody ever taste a diet right? Or diet Pepsi? I think the worst one is diet Coke. Personally, I think diet Coke's about as bad as any of them. Co Coke Zero tastes better because it tastes kind of like a Coke. But diet Coke tastes like, how many remember Tab? I think they took Tab and reformulated it and made diet Coke. Because Coca-Cola owns the, the Tab product. So it's been reformulated. And that's, I think that's where diet Coke came from. <laughs> Give me water. All right. Now. Get your information from the right place. Hallelujah. Look at 1 Chronicles 10. That's near Kings. Actually, 1 Chronicles was at one time named 3rd Chronicles. 1st and 2nd Kings are 1st and 2nd Chronicles. And then 1st uh, uh, and 2nd Chronicles are 3rd and 4th. They changed it sometime. But you know, it's not, the name of the book is not God ordained. First Chronicles chapter 10, verse 13. Listen to this. So died, Saul died, why? For his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it, and inquired down of the Lord, for he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. Notice he, was, he died because he transgressed against the Lord and the word of the Lord. You need to get your information from the right place. And all these people who get on Facebook and get on television and mock and, and decry Christians and say all kinds of slanderous things against Christ and against the kingdom of God and say you're a hate monger if you don't agree with their sinful lifestyle is not where you need to be getting your information. You need to get into the book and get your information out of God's word and do what God's word says and forget all them crazy people. Because what are they? They're emissaries of the devil. They're speaking the words of Satan. They're speaking the wisdom of this world which is earthly, sensual, and devilish. God's word is, God's wisdom is, is peaceable, easy to be entreated. Amen? It'll lead you into the path of righteousness and true holiness. Can somebody say glory be to God? Make sure you get your, nah. Did y'all turn that clock back with daylight saving time changed? Ain't no way it's that late. Listen, if I keep you a little bit longer, all the people who got to the restaurant first will be gone. Then you can go right in and get a table. Hallelujah. Amen. Where are you getting your information? Get it from God. Your mind, I, I, I got to finish this. Your mind can be deceived. <coughs> I've seen deceived people. And if you stay deceived long enough, you can lose your salvation and walk with God. Right. I've shared this about the girl that, that was a good friend of Jamie and I. I heard her husband, a good friend of ours when we first got saved. Uh, well, actually, we were saved and uh, she worked. She was a friend of a co-worker of Jamie's. And they were having a company picnic, and Jane said, honey, can you talk to this girl? She, I mean, my friend from work is bringing her friend who's messed up. That girl was messed up. 
She was living with an older man. She's like 18, living with some 30-year-old guy. And just, I mean, it's been in and out of all kind of crazy relationships. Just messed up. And uh, I spent the whole afternoon ministering to her, sharing with Jesus. Well, she got saved. Came into our church. Got filled with the Holy Ghost. She was a tongue talker. Hallelujah. Born again tongue talker. Got our big Bible. Bible toting, tongue talking, devil destroying Christian. Hallelujah. You need to be like that. I mean, you need to take the devil on head up. Amen. Praise God. Put the word on him. I mean, she, so she was born again filled with spirit. Got, got the flow in the gifts of the spirit. Walked with God. I mean, you know, she, meant, she would get in place. She would prophesy in church or have interp tongues and interpretation in church. I mean, she was walking in the things of God. This day, she curses the blood of Jesus. She mocks the blood of Jesus. She said she, she mocks and, and, and she not only mocks the blood, she mocks Jesus. She got to see somewhere. In her mind. And it turned her. And now she, I mean, she just publicly writes on her Facebook. She thinks she's some alternate reality guru from somewhere. She's got devils. Crazy devils. And where did it start? The first place it started, she rejected the authority of her pastor. And if you can't submit to me, go submit to somebody. You've got to be submitted. You've got to have somebody speak into your life. Somebody's got to be able to speak into your life. But they all quit going to church, went home and had house church with their family. You've got to have somebody in charge, and it can't just be you. You've got to be somebody who can speak of, of, with authority from the, to your life what God says and, you know, and, and bring you into the place where you need to be brought. If you, and, and got to the place, she, her and her husband just, just lived together for, for years, fought all the time, weren't, weren't living as husband and wife for years. Then she took on this alternate personality. Started, so she blogs and curses the blood of Jesus and mocks Christians and talks about, you know, uh, how Jesus is in the way and all kinds of stuff. We're talking about born again, tongue, talking, Bible talking, devil destroying, prophesying tongue, I mean, tongues interpretation, Christian. Mocking the blood of Jesus. And the Bible says, if you count the blood of the covenant wherewith you were sanctified, an unholy thing, there remaineth no more repentance for you. My God. I mean, you talk, when I saw that, my, my heart ached. Oh, my heart ached. Because you knew if they had made the right decision and kept the right heart and kept, got their information from the right places as they walked with God, they wouldn't be in that place. But you cut off. Cut it off. And allow Satan to take ascendancy in your thinking. Half God said, did God really do He knows this. He knows there's other ways to get to heaven. Then why did Jesus say he was the way, the truth, the life? No man comes to the Father but by him. Amen. Well, he was just one of the good. No, no, he can't be a good prophet and lie like that. If, he, if there are other ways, that's a lie. And you're not good prophets if you're lying about how to get to heaven. No, Jesus didn't lie. There is no other way. In the book, I mean, the, the Bible says this, there is no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. But at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Where are you getting your information? Because where you get your information determines what's going to be coming up out of you. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringing forth good things. You put the wrong treasure in. I mean, you can't go to your bank today, this afternoon, and pull out $50,000 if you don't have $50,000 deposited in there. They won't let you do it. Are you here? Some folks think they can. You can't do it. You can't write a check for $325 if you've got 67 cents in your bank account. It'll come to your bank. You'll say, no way, Jose. We ain't cashing that. There ain't no money in there. So we're to live out of the man on the inside. Let the life of God come out of us. Can you say amen? Amen, oh me, or help me, Jesus. I, would, I left Genesis 3, didn't I? Y'all gave me 40 minutes. I've only used 10 of them. They knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam said, Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God amongst the trees. I mean, one of the first things that will happen to you when you're not walking with God is you're ashamed. You don't want to be in his presence. Why? Because his presence is holy. See, that's why I get really upset when these people tell people, you know, you're under grace. It doesn't matter what you do. You can just, you, God, you, God loves you. You really can't enter into his presence because there's, there's something in you that's going to go that. I'm not right. Yeah. What do I do about that? If we confess our sins, 
He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why? So we can stand in his presence without that sense of condemnation. Why? Because John said that if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. See, when you live out of your spirit, you walk in a place where your heart always has confidence and you can go in the presence of God, which is where you want to be and you're supposed to be. Amen? But if your heart's condemning you, then you don't have confidence toward God. Not that God doesn't love you. God came down looking for them. And they were hiding. And that's what you do when you sin. When you live out of your flesh, don't live out of your spirit. You don't want to, you really don't want to, you don't want to be around God. You don't want to be around somebody that's prophesying. I mean, you know, I, I had a roommate. Rhema story. Room, yeah. This ain't as bad as mine. Well, about, well, there was three of us that left Greenville. Well, actually, five people from Greenville went to Raymond the same year. But three of us, you know, we, um, we all went together, got an apartment. Now, one of the guys was older, and he was, now, listen, when you first get saved and you love the Lord, you believe anything anybody tells you. You do. Now, we're supposed to, now, King James says we always believe the best. Now, the Amplified makes that a little bit clearer to me. It says we're ever ready to believe the best of every person. It means you want to, but if it ain't there, it ain't there. Well, you've got to believe the best. No, 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 no. I want to. But if it ain't there, it ain't there. Yeah. He punched me in the face and knocked me across the room and knocked out three of my teeth. But he really didn't mean to. I wanted to believe. I really believe he really didn't want to. <laughs> Stupid. No, you wanted to, but that ain't there. You can't believe it ain't there. That's a faith project or a prayer project. Yeah. Actually, it's an intercession project. But you don't have to be with them getting your teeth knocked out yeah. in your intercession project. Right. All right. So we want to believe the best. How do I get on believing the best of every person? Huh? Roommate. So I had one, you know, one of the roommates, you know, the other, the other one was, anyway. But this one, this one was the older one. And, and he told us, he said, you know, I was homosexual, but I got saved and I'm, I'm straight. You know, oh, praise God. Praise God. Jesus can fix anybody. Yeah. I, ne I really didn't suspect anything was wrong until Dad Hagen, asked, his crusade leader, asked him to travel and play the organ for him. And he wouldn't do it. I'm like, I've been, saved, you know, I've been saved less than a year. I'm thinking, he asked you to travel and play with him on the crusade team, and, and you won't? Why? People living in sin don't want to be around the anointing. If they want to live in sin, when they're living in sin, they want to live in sin. They don't want to be around people who get, get they'll, they'll find them a church that don't preach anything. Right. I went to church today. They, you know, the metropolitan community churches in America are, are quote, and, and I use this term beyond loosely, homosexual churches. And they teach them all the scriptures that, that prohibit homosexuality in the Bible. They tell them why that's not really in the Bible and that really doesn't mean what it says. I know, I got, I know people there, Okay. I've read behind them. They take the scriptures and totally ob obliterate them and, say, and, and, and change the Greek meanings and all kinds of stuff so that it doesn't prohibit homosexuality. You can't change the Bible to fit what you want to do. And there's a lot of people going around saying, you know, it doesn't matter what you do. You can do it living, living where you want to because you're under grace. And they say 1 John 1, 9 wasn't written to the church. Well, who in the world was it written to? When James says in the beginning, he writes to the 12 tribes that are dispersed abroad. Yeah. And my brethren... Count it all joy. I wonder who he's talking to, my brethren. Right. He ain't talking to a bunch of sinners. He's talking to my brethren. Right. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. He actually goes, and I write these things unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen? Isn't that right? Where was I? Roommate. So my roommate's, why don't you want to be around Brother Hagin? I, 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 it didn't take me long. I'm, I mean, I'm not, I'm young in the Lord. I am Y-N-D, young and dumb. If somebody says that God told yeah, I believe it. Now, my wisdom doesn't keep me from believing God does supernatural, miraculous things. But I've got some, I've been around the block a few times. And when people do, or don't want to be around the anointing, it's usually a telltale sign. Something going on. Hello. Well, I come back from school one day, walk in. He's laying in the bed with another man wrapped up hugging each other. 
I'm like, get the holy water and the oil out, go over to God. I mean, I'm like, what the world? The Lord led me to the bathroom at Sears and told me to call that number on the stall. This guy, this guy was a Raymond graduate who had gone back into homosexuality. Next thing I know, there's some old guy. He comes around the park. He's a homo. I'm like, I got to move. I got to, I, I, I got, I got to get out of here. I could, but you know, the, that roommate started to spend all his time away. I'm like, I was getting twitches. I'll be honest with you. You know, because they weren't interested in changing. They were just interested in living a lifestyle. Had a chance to travel and minister with Brother Hagin. Didn't want to. Why? Because he didn't want to be around the anointing. And when, I mean, this, you, need to go, you need to check your heart. When you don't want to be around the anointing, you better start doing some checking up. The people leave our church because they don't want to be around the anointing. They want to go to someplace fine where they can get away with stuff. Even if, it's a, even if it's a good church, it's a big church where they can hide and not be dealt with, they'll go do it. Because they don't want to be around the anointing. Because Pastor Ed doesn't pull any punches. You know why I don't pull any punches? Can I tell you why? It's because I love you. I care about your being. I care about your future. I care about your walk with the Lord. And I'm not going to pull any punches and dress it up so you can live however you want to live without being challenged by God's word and his anointing to take it up a higher level. And live out of the spirit, not live out of your flesh. Because I can tell you, living out of your spirit is where you need to be. Oh, glory to God. You talk about joy unspeakable and full of glory. You talk about walking with God, having communion with the, in the spirit, with the father of spirits, glory to God. Talking about living in a place where your flesh just can't keep you down, but the life on the inside keeps rising up. See, Satan lied to him. God, and, and then they, they, they fell for it. And God said, where are you? Well, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid, hid myself, and uh, because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten the tree where I command you shouldn't eat? Now we start the pass the buck job. Man said, "Now look, I was doing fine, going along in life." Me and the animals just having, you know, it was great here. I just, uh, I just took care of them and watched over them, the, the, took care of the garden. And then you had to come up and give me the woman. Up until then, everything was great. Now, the woman who you gave me, you know, they talk about how many times do people pass the buck? Now, the woman, she did it. But let me be really honest with you. It's your fault because you gave her to me. You weren't saying that when he gave her to you. I mean, you woke up there, she wasn't, you went, whoa, man. Come on, guys. Get with the program here. That's, that's supposed to be funny. But now, it's your fault. You gave her to me. She gave me the tree, fruit of the tree, and I did eat. God looks at the woman and says, what about it? Well, you know, the serpent, he beguiled me. And, and so it's, it's really your fault because you created him. And God turns on the serpent and says, you know, and he curses him. He's going to crawl on his belly and the, uh, the seed of the woman will bruise your head and you'll bruise his heel. But now they became carnal beings. They had to constantly overcome their flesh. Their first, their, their offspring murders one of their other offspring. I mean, it's bad enough to lose a child, but to have your own, your own child murder your other child because they didn't want to bring the sacrifice. That's why God said bring the sacrifice. They're living carnal. God says, bring this kind of sacrifice. They bring, well, that's the, I, what I want to bring is good enough. He brings it. God's not happy about it. And he gets mad at his brother for bringing the right one and kills him. We're just, we're just, we're just diving into carnality. But Jesus has come. We're no longer bound to the dictates of the flesh. We can live out of our spirits and alive unto God because of life in us. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, PO Box 7752, 
Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.